Next, we're going to be looking at more invertebrates in chapter 13, part 8. We're going to be looking at phylum Annelida. Phylum Annelida contains only one type of worm, the segmented worm. So the earthworm is a good example. They inhabit pretty much every bit of topsoil all over the world. They have bilateral symmetry. They have lots of segments. These segments appear as if they are stacked one on top of each other. And earthworms actually have a clitellum. A clitellum is a barrel-shaped swelling that helps produce the cocoon related with earthworm reproduction. But the clitellum also happens to be really close to the head. And it lets us know which side is cephalic or towards the head compared to the tail. Here's the base anatomy of an earthworm. We have a complete digestive system that begins with a mouth and then leads to the pharynx. From the pharynx, we have the esophagus, which leads to the crop. The crop is a temporary storage area for food before it goes to the gizzard, where chemical digestion and grinding take place. From there, it then will enter into the intestines, which proceeds throughout the rest of the worm. It ends in the anus, so any indigestible foodstuffs will exit out the end of the worm as well, near the tail. Here is the swelling or clitellum, which is much closer to the head than the tail. We also have aortic arches, which act kind of like modified blood vessels to pump blood throughout the dorsal and the ventral blood vessel. There's also a ventral nerve cord, and the ventral nerve cord is towards the belly. And we see at the very front of the nerve cord kind of swellings of nervous tissue that is the brain or the ganglia there's plenty of circular muscle that allows these segments of this worm to move congruently and the individual body segments are called setae we can also look at a picture of an earthworm that's not a drawing on the right and we can see where the clitellum is and this swelling here is much closer to the head and that helps us identify the head compared to the tail. So again, the anterior end of the earthworm closest to the clitellum. The earthworm's mouth is at the tip of the anterior end, with its tail being at the tip of the posterior end near the anus. And the earthworm moves with a combination of muscular movement using essentially two layers of smooth muscle. They also use small bristles that are on their underside called setae. The worm has longitudinal and circular layers of muscles to have that kind of characteristic worm-like movement be performed. And we see that the earthworm uses these muscles in its setae to crawl along the surface and tunnel through dirt. So the movement of an earthworm is essentially using muscles that go from segment to segment to produce that kind of scrunching movement and then elongation that follows. We can also look at the feeding habits of an earthworm. It has a complete digestive tract. It ingests soil through powerful sucking action of its pharynx, and then it's going to use things like the crop and the gizzard to help process that food. The gizzard actually can perform really strong muscular contractions of its own to grind that soil into an organic matter that can be absorbed along the entirety of the worm's small intestines, or essentially just intestines, and that soil gets passed down to the intestine and then out to the anus. So an earthworm is going to eat using a digestive system. It's going to actually be able to extract nutrients from what it eats. And it's actually really important to create topsoil that we consider fertilized or nutrient rich. After digestion, material that wasn't digested exits the intestines. We can also look at what was absorbed as the food was processed. It's absorbed by the blood that circulates through the walls of the intestine. The blood is then transported with the nutrient-rich material to cells of the worm's body. We also can talk about the metabolites that can be gathered from small organs and sent to nephridia. Nephridia are essentially kind of like the kidneys of the earthworm, and they're in every segment of an earthworm's body except the first three and the very last ones. So they're going to essentially act like filters to get rid of nitrogenous waste and they actually get rid of this waste out tiny holes called nephridiophores. The earthworm does need food to survive, but its digestive habits also have plenty of other benefits, like loosening the soil, and that's because the earthworm tunnels through it. And its eating habits create very fertile soil. It's not trying to introduce oxygen 
or allow spaces to be created so that water can filter into the loosened soil. It's not necessarily trying to tunnel up and down in a certain way in order to create topsoil that's much more mineral rich than it would be otherwise, but that's exactly what it does. And earthworm secretions can also be added to the soil, and that makes the soil very fertile. And the soil cannot stay fertile year after year if it wasn't for the fact that earthworms help in the generation of fertilization of topsoil. The earthworm not only has a complete digestive system, it has a closed circulatory system. That's a system where blood stays in blood vessels. They don't really have a heart, but they do have modified aortic arches that do act kind of like the heart in order to pump blood. The aortic arches do pump blood. They cause it to move through the ventral blood vessel, allowing that blood to flow all over the earthworm's body. Then they collect it in the dorsal blood vessel that takes it back to the aortic arches. And so that process starts all over again. The blood picks up nutrients as it moves through the blood vessels, and that blood takes oxygen to the cells. The blood picks up carbon dioxide from the cells that will release later via waste. And expiration of carbon dioxide and inspiration of oxygen happens at the surface of the earthworm's body through its thin epidermis. So it happens through its skin. The earthworm doesn't have a true lung. So earthworms breathe through their skin. As long as that outer layer stays wet, it's able to perform this type of chemical reaction. And we can also look at the nervous system of an earthworm. For as small as they are, and as complex as they don't seem, they actually have a pretty complex nervous system that allow them to respond to outside stimuli. They can respond to sound, touch, and even taste. What we're considering their brain is actually a mass of nerve cell bodies called a ganglia. And the two main ganglia that are at the anterior portion of the worm help coordinate the responses of the earthworm. And there's also a large ventral nerve cord that travels down the bottom or the belly of the earthworm from the brain towards the tail. Here we can see a close look at the cerebral ganglia or brain and how the dorsal blood vessel does not have a counterpart to the ventral nerve cord like the ventral blood vessel does. Earthworms are also hermaphroditic, like the hydra we've looked at before. They possess both male and female reproductive organs, but they cannot mate with themselves. That's different than what the hydra can do. It can mate with itself. So earthworm actually have to find a partner with which to reproduce. So they have to essentially find a partner to perform sexual reproduction with, even though they contain both parts needed for sexual reproduction. They're going to produce sperm in an area similar to the testes, and that is called the seminal vesicles. And then their eggs are produced in a structure very similar to ovaries, and that's going to be in the oviduct. And when an earthworm mates, it finds another worm, but that worm has to be pointed in the opposite direction of itself. And then they're going to attach themselves using kind of some slime. They create a slime tube, and that's going to allow them to exchange sperm. And then that sperm will be emptied from seminal vesicles into seminal pouches for temporary storage. And then from the pouches, which are actually called seminal receptacles, that sperm will eventually make it to the oviducts to cause fertilization. And when the worms separate, they will essentially have their own slime tube wrapped around their interior ends. After a few days, the slime tube actually turns into a cocoon around the clitellum. And the cocoon, as the worm pulls through it, passes over the oviduct, and that's going to pull the sperm from the seminal receptacles into the oviduct and cause fertilization. And when the worm is completely free of the cocoon, it is sealed, and fertilization takes place within the sealed cocoon, and in a few weeks, a young earthworm will break out of the cocoon. There are other types of segmented worms as well, even though we were function we were focusing on the earthworm. The leech is another type of segmented worm. It tends to be mostly freshwater. But there are marine types or some that live in soil. They do have two suckers on the head portion or anterior end, and they are going to have usually one on the posterior or back end. And those suckers are used to latch onto their prey. A lot of leeches tend to be at least slightly parasitic, and they are also used in medicine, but not just any leech is used in medicine. These have to be medicinally grown or harvested, 
and then they're used to essentially get rid of a bad blood. Now, this can still occur medically, but it is a practice that's mostly been left behind. But they used to use really just any type of leech to get rid of what they thought was bad blood, which was not really bad blood. And occasionally this would make someone even sicker. This process was called bloodletting. Another type of segmented worm is the polychaetes. A feather duster worm is a good example. You can see that in the lower left. And the Christmas tree worm is another example. So they tend to look mostly kind of like coral or sea anemones. And a lot of them are going to be aquatic and primarily marine. And then we can't forget other types of worms like the flatworm, phylum platyhelminth. Planarian is a great example of a flatworm. They can be freshwater, and most of them are. They eat small animals they can grab with their mouth. They have eye spots, and they are also going to be able to utilize a nervous system that's very similar to earthworms. Their nervous system actually attaches to their eye spots. And the eye spots are not like our own eyes. They are actually just stimulating areas that can receive whether or not there's light there or not. And if light is present, they tend to move toward it. Planarians move towards light to seek out prey. They're oftentimes after cyanobacteria or other photosynthetic organisms. Their nervous system is complex enough that they can also sense, taste, smell, and touch. And they do sexually reproduce like earthworms, meaning they are hermaphroditic, but can sexually reproduce upon the exchange of sperm with a mate. They can also, however, asexually reproduce via regeneration, which is a type of fragmentation, essentially where they regrow a missing part of the body. Here we can see planarian asexual reproduction. They're just splitting. And then other members of phylum platyhelminth, or the flatworms, include some parasitic flatworms, such as tapeworms and flukes. And then there's phylum nematoba. Nematoda is going to be roundworms, so they are going to possess, like the earthworm, bilateral symmetry, but they are not going to be flat like platyhelminths, and they're not going to be as segmented as annelida. They're instead really just kind of non-segmented cylindrical worms, and they are going to be much smaller than the organisms we were seeing in phylum annelida. They are also essentially a tube within a tube, and the tube within a tube is their complete digestive system. And a lot of these species are parasitic, like the roundworm Trichinella. Trichinella spiralis lives in the guts of pigs and game animals. And we essentially could get it in our bodies if we eat pork or game animals that's undercooked and therefore infected with the worms. Juvenile worms tend to break from cysts after being consumed, and they begin to develop into a mature adult in humans. They cause trichinosis. So the trichinella worm causes trichinosis. And that presents first essentially with irritation of the intestinal tract, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Later on, muscle pain, swelling, and joint pain. And those affected can recover, but it can take up to six months. They could have permanent heart and eye damage, depending on where the worms persisted in the human body. And oftentimes, really strong antiparasitics have to be taken. So here you can see the life cycle for trichinosis or trichinella spiralis that causes trichinosis. And it begins, at least in humans, when we eat undercooked pork. Then in the muscle of that pork, trichinella is going to break free. And then it essentially gets to move through different parts of the human body. It likes to inhabit parts of the digestive system and muscle around that area. And then phylum mollusca. So moving a little bit away from worms, we're looking at an invertebrate that now has essentially some type of shell. For the most part, these organisms are soft-bodied, but they have to have some type of shell, whether internal or external. It includes things like gastropods, bi bivalves, and cephalopods. They all have an open circulatory system that does include a heart. So they are not going to have a closed circulatory system, meaning they're going to have kind of open-ended vessels that bathe tissues with a fluid. They have other structures like a mantle, 
which helps hold on to vital organs of the mollusk, a shell, which is usually for protection, a visceral hump that contains a lot of vital organs like the heart and digestive system and the excretory organs, and the foot, which is going to be something that can be used for locomotion, but it depends on the animal. Something really interesting about mollusks are their radula, which is a scraping teeth-like structure, and is what mollusks use to scrape food into their mouth. Here we're looking at a snail, and this is a general mollusk. You can see the shell that's protective. Most of their organs they're in. They have some sensory organs like an eye and a tentacle. They have a digestive system similar to the aniline. Includes things like a crop and intestines, but they also have an outcropping we consider the stomach. And then down here, they have a foot, which is essentially a modified structure for locomotion. And gastropods are a type of mollusk. They're going to be the largest group of mollusks. They include things like slugs and snails. Gastropod means stomach foot, and the foot associated with slugs and snails we see on their underside primarily, but they use for locomotion. The snail is known as a univalve because it has one shell that's for protection. They move using their foot by laying down a slime layer. They can actually move about nine feet per hour. They glide along the side slime they produce digesting food, and they expose many waste that's produced via the end of their alimentary canal called the anus. Their mantle, which contains blood vessels, is very vascularized, and their sensory organs are twofold. Two pairs of tentacles, a long pair for response to light stimuli, similar to the eye spots in planarians, and a short pair for touch and smell. So here again is our gastropod. Bivalves have two shells. Clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops are examples. They all fit within class bivalvia. There tend to be freshwater, but there's plenty of um, marine types. They are aquatic almost unanimously. And they have gills for respiration. They're going to feed by pumping water over the gills and trap food that may be in the water. So they're some type of filter feeder. And they use their muscular foot to dig into the sand or mud to hide. Here's the base anatomy of a bivalve. You can see most of the important organs are going to be central or protected by the shell. And they're also going to have a very muscular foot for locomotion and digging in sand. And then we have the cephalopods, which mean head foot. Something like an octopus or a squid or a nautilus fits within these cephalopods. For the most part, we're going to see an internal shell. In every type of cephalopod except for the nautilus, it has an external shell. These organisms tend to have tentacles, and we're going to see they have a single foot. That foot is essentially what became their tentacles or their arms. Cephalopods are some of the smartest or most intelligent types of mollusks. They're very agile and they're going to be very quick moving. So octopus or octopi are some of the best examples of cephalopods, especially when it comes to their intelligence. They can actually solve puzzles. They're actually going to use their arms or their many tentacles to capture prey. They're going to use tentacles to muscularly capture prey as opposed to the use of hematocysts like we saw in the jellyfish. Their mouth, however, is central, right in the middle of those expanded arms, surrounded usually by multiple tentacles, and they pull their prey into this mouth. In organisms like the squid and like the octopus, that internal shell essentially is kind of like a beak structure that is their mouth. And that is it for. Chapter 13, Part C. So make sure you watch both parts and prepare, prepare for an earthworm dissection this Friday.